ladies and gentlemen, General Islam, the President Chairman of CGSS, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency the High Commissioner for Sri Lanka in Pakistan. It's a great honor for me to come back to Islamabad and be with Center for Global Strategic Studies. Now, unlike the morning session, I'm going to take you to the sea. In the morning, we heard about the fresh water, the rivers, the canals, the deltas, and the dams. So I'm going to now venture into the ocean. If you remember one of the slides, it said how much we have about 72 to 75% of our planet Earth is water. And out of that, 97% is ocean. So how can we not talk about water in a water-related water seminar? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you about the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, to me, in six words, it is an ocean of strategic competition, it is an ocean of strategic convergences, and of strategic dilemma. I guess countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka are normally found in the third category, where we have strategic dilemmas of other strategic partners in the region. So therefore, during the next 20 minutes, I will be talking to you about a very pertinent topic that is maritime security governance, maritime security governance in the Indian Ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, for smaller states in the Indian Ocean, it's all about development, economic prosperity, acquiring technology, but for major powers, it is a contest to gain strategic relevance in the Indian Ocean. And therefore, unfortunately, the Indian Ocean region is no longer a benign region. And it is a contested region. It is increasingly becoming a contested region. The maritime order is increasingly being contested. What we need is unfettered supply of oil, and what we need is the cargo to be carried. No shipping, no shopping. That is as simple as that. And therefore, the Indian Ocean region, which is now accounting for 50% of world containers, 70% of world oil, and 35% of bulk cargo, is of high economic relevance. And therefore, it has become an area of security concern as well. For convenience sake, we divide the Indian Ocean into two. We call it the Western Indian Ocean or the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. Unfortunately, Pakistan is in the Western Indian Ocean, which is not the most peaceful ocean in the world. On comparatively, the Bay of Bengal is relatively peaceful in the 21st century. Now what we see now in the Indian Ocean is the unipolar world is gradually changing into a multipolar world. The question is, are we ready for that change? Are we ready for multilateral security arrangements? What we right now witness in the Indian Ocean is insecurity of one or some countries is leading to the insecurity of many other countries and we have to be engaged in an unnecessary arms race in the Indian Ocean. And I also call the Indian Ocean as a region of strategic deficit or as region of strategic mistrust. So therefore, we heard even in the morning, we need confidence building measures in diplomatic, military and strategic areas as well. However, we all agree that the maritime order or the law of the sea is generally being respected and is being abided by in the Indian Ocean. And therefore, I would say this is the best time to talk about it rather than talking about or reacting later. When you talk about the Indian Ocean, 
there are some major strategic concerns and issues and I would not in a particular order and I would say the instability of Gulf petroleum exporting countries is a major security concern for the Indian Ocean. The Shia Sunni fault lines, the increased militarization possibly leading to nuclearization is a major concern and also two of the world's key choke points for oil, flow of oil, Babel Mandeb and Strait of Hormuz are located in that area and that area is not the most peaceful area. We have groups operating with anti-ship missiles and remotely controlled high-speed suicide boats in that region. So it is not the most peaceful region. Of course, uh, I'm not an authority to talk about Indo-Pakistan conflict, but we heard about that in the morning as well. So I also do see that Indo-Pakistan conflict and the mistrust as a major strategic concern in the Indian Ocean. Both are nuclear powered powers, both are having advanced large military forces, both countries are in the process of developing their and modernizing their military capabilities. And we also heard reference to Kashmir, 71 years down the lane, the dispute is not resolved. And both countries accuse each other of cross-border terrorism and we even saw some photographs in the morning session uh, about the, this aspect. So this regional, this bilateral conflict, which is having nuclear capability can be, can spill over to be a regional conflict. That is a major worry. Then another issue is the str struggle for influence between China and the USA. We all know that China has emerged as the major economic power in Asia and in the world standing they are number two and growing. And President Xi addressing the 19th Congress in Beijing stated by 2035 China wishes to be a modernized military and by 2050 China wishes to be a great power. Now the rise of the China and development of the People's Liberation Navy has not gone very well with many other players in the Indian Ocean. The USA to me is a non-resident power in the Indian Ocean but the major power and China to me is a resident power and a rising military power or rising naval power in the Indian Ocean. The USA, the military power is on a relative decline but they try to maintain the same status quo through partnerships and also through alliances. They are not ready to give away the predominant position that they enjoy in the Indian Ocean. So what is happening in the Indian Ocean is states try to outthink, outmaneuver, outpartner and outinnovate each other and that is leading to conflict and con uh, uh, co conflict in the Indian Ocean. Then the another one, another strategic concern is the conflict and tension between India and China. They have unhealed wounds from 1962 war. They have, un I mean, disputed land borders and also Ch Pakistan's strong relations with China and CPAC and uh, the all-weather friendship has not gone well with India and they all always viewed it this as a concern. Now China is, a, I mean, this is the most powerful economy in Asia and we all believe that they have surplus cash and they have been doing, they have been engaged in developing large scale infrastructure projects around India, whether it is Myanmar, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives or even for that matter Pakistan. Now that has not gone well with India India always concerned about the possible strangulation theory by China. China's Belt and Road Initiative, it is the most, the biggest infrastructure connectivity related project in the world today. And the problem is that it is launched by China, which is considered as a developing country. And the scale of this project is 1 trillion US dollars and many countries do see 
the Belt and Road Initiative as an opportunity to enhance maritime related infrastructure and maritime connectivity. If you look at SAP, the World Bank says only 5% of our GDP is interconnected. Simply, our infrastructure is not sufficient. And also, India, in order to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, they have come out with their own concepts. Uh, Bel uh, the Sagar Mala, that is a port-related development project. Then Sagar, that is sec uh, security and growth for all in the region. And also with Japan, they have come, with, come up with Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. However, these initiatives have not really gone ahead the way the Belt and Road Initiative has. However, all is not bad with India and China. During the last four years, the two leaders have met 15 times. President Xi and Prime Minister Modi, and now we hear about Wuhan spirit, Shangri-La spirit, because there is discussion and the trade has grown between the two countries from 74 billion about five years ago to 84. Maritime terrorism is another major issue in the Indian Ocean. Sri Lanka suffered for three decades due to maritime terrorism or the terrorists exploiting the international shipping lanes, international ports and international seagoing vessels in the Indian Ocean. And also the situation in Yemen which is not still sorted out and that can be uh, in a very strategic location in the Indian Ocean or in the Western Indian Ocean. And we have heard about anti-ship missiles being fired and remotely operated high-speed suicide boats being used in that area. Then another non-state threat is the irregular migration by sea, transnational crime of human trafficking. Until about 2012, Sri Lanka was considered as a major source country for human trafficking. Thank God we are no longer in that category. Of course, another one is illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. The FAO, the UN estimate 40% of fishing taking place in the Indian Ocean as illegal. And that is actually ruining our maritime environment, which is already depleted by human-made and land-based pollution. Well, there are three other areas that I would like to talk about as strategic concern. That is the COD, that is the four countries getting together, India, America, Japan, and Australia, and the COD plus, that is uh, America, uh, England and France getting together. So the big question is, do we need a COD in the Indian Ocean? The question number two is, is COD going to be a military alliance? In such a situation, would it not lead to officialize the unofficial Cold War in the Indian Ocean? Because when you have a military alliance against, possibly against China, that probably would lead to a maritime Cold War situation. And that is something I believe we need to avoid at any cost. Then again, another uh, another thing we, we need to talk about is China factor. Some say China should not be in the Indian Ocean, but do we need China out or do we need to work with China? The World Bank estimate from 2016 to 2030, South Asia and the East Asia need 459 billion US dollars for development of infrastructure. Where can this money come from? So China factor has to be considered. And of course, China has been a major economic power in the 18th century. So whether the history is repeating itself, that is something we can witness now. And many countries, as I mentioned, do see China and the Belt and Road Initiative as an opportunity, not as a threat except, of course, India has not yet joined. And then there are bilateral projects like China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and now we hear about China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. So when I hear about China-Pakistan Economic Corridor as a regional connectivity problem, I have a problem with the name. When you say China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, how do you expect India to join that? So what's in a name? But then these are considerations. Then also in the recent past, just as last month, we see another trilateral partnership coming out, Japan, Australia, and USA. They signed an agreement 
they issued a communique and that is called trilateral partnership for infrastructure investment in the indo pacific the objective of this trilateral is to get the private sector investment also involved in infrastructure projects and basically it is to counter china i mean we all can understand that and also to enhance digital connectivity energy infrastructure and achieving of mutual development goals so ladies and gentlemen i would say that the indian ocean is heavily militarized at any given time there are about 100 and 100 100 to 120 warships present in the indian ocean although the piracy is near zero the international navies are pretty much in the indian ocean i like to share very briefly some interesting figures from 2008 to 2018 440 warships have visited sri lankan ports foreign warships this belongs to 28 different countries and that's great i'm not complaining because it's money because it's economic uh, for us but this is an, an indication that the indian ocean is heavily militarized and if you are interested topping the list being our neighbor is india and second despite the common belief that china is trying to exert pressure in sri lanka it is japan and way below is china of course pakistan bangladesh russia coming close so ladies and gentlemen in such a situation what do we need i for the for the sake of all the countries we need a rule based maritime order we need respect for international conventions we heard quite a lot about the indus valley treaty this morning how it is not respected so we need freedom of navigation and overflow and we need freedom of commerce and economic prosperity we are not rich countries yet i mean we were rich countries in the 18th century but right now we are not so we need economic prosperity and also what should be the maritime security the in state we want maritime threats to be countered maritime risk to be managed and maritime freedom to be preserved and we need mutually beneficial collective security deepening interoperability and security cooperation among the littorals in the indian ocean at the same time we don't want a single hegemonic power trying to dominate the matters in the indian ocean we would like to see partnership based on sovereign equality and that should give us the win win situation and not the winner take it all situation so in the next one is in such a situation in such a need what do we really need i think we need to develop our capacities and capabilities for knowing what is happening at sea maritime domain awareness the imo stated 57% of merchant ships flying in the indian ocean do not report their position accurately and also these ships do not operate the automatic identification system at all times as stipulated by the ISPS code 40% of ships are fishing is illegal so that mean we do not really know what is happening in the indian ocean and therefore i would suggest what we need is to uh, develop maritime domain awareness or to develop a tactical picture of the area then another region another area that i would like to argue is we don't have our own strategy in the indian ocean we always take uh, strategies of other people we keep talking about japan's pre and open indo pacific policy we keep talking about america's rebalance into indo pacific where is our own strategy where is sark strategy we don't have one as long as we don't have our own strategy we will have to dance to the tunes of other strategies so this is i think one of the major areas that i have to uh, suggest uh, that we need to develop a uh, our own strategy well it may be it may not be possible to develop a com comprehensive strategy for the whole of indian ocean so why not the western indian ocean then why not sark why not bimstek on the other side so we have to think of having our own strategy so ladies and gentlemen in conclusion i can say that the indian ocean region is economically and strategically 
one of the most important oceans in the 21st century. And there is a huge trust deficit and mistrust in the area and we are maritime blind in the Indian Ocean. What we need is collective capacities and collective capabilities. What we need is to move from cooperation to collaboration. And also we need inclusive partnership, not merely uh, uh, individual partnership, but inclusive partnership. And we need integrated strategy and policy approach. And also we need definitely good governance at sea, a rule-based maritime order, while maintaining maritime security, we need maritime governance as well. Now the problem is, everybody talk about the need for a rule-based maritime order. Everyone is talking about a new Indian Ocean Security Order. Everyone is talking about a new Indian Ocean Security Architecture. So what is it going to be? We have not really put our thoughts together. Is it going to be a code of conduct? Is it going to be through the existing mechanisms? Do we have to create a new mechanism? And I would say Pakistan definitely should be a member of IORA. I mean, Pakistan is a member of IONS, but not a member of IORA. How can that be? Pakistan as an important country should be a member of IORA. So in conclusion, I can say the Indian Ocean security is very important, not only to the Indian Ocean, but to the entire world. What we need now is a maritime security architecture that, that, that we are prepared of and not the other way round. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.